Okay, are we on? We are recording. Hello everybody and welcome to another Sunday Office video. If you're new to the channel, most of my videos go out on a Wednesday and they're usually in the field landscape photography videos. But today I thought I'd do a follow-up on the last one that I uploaded on Wednesday where you saw me in Iceland shooting both film and digital. And over the period of two photography sessions or two days, I photographed six, or I showed you six images. So what I want to do is look at some of those images and look at some of the mistakes I made and some of the lessons learned because this trip to Iceland has been one big learning curve because I'm fairly new to uh, the film camera that I've got, which is a Hasselblad 501 CM. I'm new to that, so I am making mistakes all of the time and I'm learning from them. So we're gonna go over that and I'm also going to address some of the comments from that video and um, answer some of those questions slash comments. So let's just jump straight into this. And the first thing I wanted to do was look at this image here. Now this image was shot with Portra 160. Now I don't wanna alienate all those people that aren't interested in film and you shouldn't think of this video as something that's purely looking at film. Think of it as a, a general photography video, but I am just gonna quickly mention uh, what I've learned by using this film. Portra 160 is a negative film and has great dynamic range and it works really well with bright high key images. So if I'm ever lucky enough or fortunate enough to get snowy conditions here in the UK, that's probably the film of choice that I would go out and shoot with. Anyway, this image here uh, is one of three exposures. This was the first exposure I took and it came out perfectly. When I scanned this on my Epson flatbed scanner, the image, the colors, the tones, the contrast, everything was spot on. I was really happy. And then when we look at this image here, which is a longer exposure, but with a two-stop graduated filter, it's, it's purple, right? It's got this magenta purple cast, and I've had this before. I've had this before using Portra 400. So the same film, different ISO ratings. And when you look at this image here, which I shot a couple of months ago, again, very, very heavy, heavy purple magenta cast. And when I look at this image, heavy purple magenta cast. What I've realized, I think anyway, and please tell me in the comments if I'm mistaken or if you've experienced this, but with Kodak Portra film, I think, or I seem to be finding when I overexpose the film, which I do do, because I want to pull out all of the details in the shadows, right? And the great thing is about this film is it's very difficult to blow out the highlights. So you feel as if you can afford to really push it. Anyway, what I find is when I do overexpose that, uh, that film, that Kodak Portra film, the shadows go purple. Like I didn't know this was a thing and I'm struggling to pull them back and get rid of that color cast. So what I've learned from this image and this trip is when shooting with Kodak Portra, you can't just be willy-nilly with your exposure. I was willy-nilly. I was like, oh yeah, there's my meter reading. Let's whack on two stops. It can handle it. No, that's a mistake because my images are coming out purple. So from this trip, I've learned that you just got to nail your exposure. You've got to get it perfect. And that should be the case regardless of the film that you're shooting. And it also should be the case regardless whether or not you shoot digital or film. Let me know if you've had any experiences with this. I thought we'd look at another image as well. This was uh, this image seems to be a favorite amongst the viewers. I had a lot of positive feedback on this photograph. And when I look at this, uh, I really like it, I do. It's just, I think it's all about the film. This was Velvia 50. Again, I don't want to alienate, you know, people who aren't interested in film and we will move on to digital, but this film has a very rich, vibrant kind of color cast to it. So if you want your scenes to be super, super like saturated, then Velvia 50 is a great film. And you can see from this image, uh, when you look at the video, obviously it wasn't that rich and bright, but the film does that, it gives it that look. Um, and this was a great exposure. I was very happy with this exposure. And the thing with Velvia 50 is if you get it right, it looks fantastic. It's easy to scan. You don't need to process it at all. You just, you know, it's what you see is what you get. Obviously you can tweak the contrast, tweak the saturation a little bit, but generally speaking, it looks great. However, if we look at this image here, 
this was a, another shot that I really underexposed. Now I don't know what happened here because this is very underexposed and I don't think I would have metered it this much under. So what I think happened was I probably took a meter reading and when I shot the image using my Hasselblad, I would have bosh, pressed the shutter and then the lens does its thing, opens the aperture, closes the aperture. But what I didn't realize at the time was that the, uh, the shutter at the back of the camera is controlled by the amount of time that you press down the shutter. How many times have I said shutter? So if I just press it quickly like this, uh, the back of the camera is only going to open for a split second. And I reckon that's what happened here. I did explain that much better in last Sunday's video. So if you haven't seen that, feel free to go and watch. So that brings me nicely onto reading the viewer comments from that video. And thank you to everybody who not only watched the video and watched it through to the end, uh, but for everybody who commented, um, I really do appreciate it. And I'm very lucky to have a mostly nice, sensible audience. <laughs> uh, I was actually struggling on this video to find the trolls. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and read some of the, the comments and address those. So John May commented, he said, this has been a wonderful series, successes, failures, and you, as always, being so open about it all. These images were all gorgeous. Well, thank you, John, much appreciated. I think what's important here is that John picks up on me being open about it all. Now, from the very start of this channel, from years, years ago, when I first started through till today, I always want to be open and honest about everything. And what I always say is my YouTube channel is not my photography portfolio. It's not. If I was to only release videos that, you know, contained very successful award-winning images, not only would that not really show a true, true reflection of what it takes to be out in the field getting those images, but it, it would mean that I'd probably release like four videos a year, you know, unfortunately, um, I don't have that many successes, but I do like to show the process. And for me as well, I say this quite a lot, is it's not always about, you know, I'm not a professional commissioned photographer. I'm not shooting images for other people, for clients, for customers. I'm shooting images for me. So for me, it's all about being out there, trying, learning and experimenting. And I try and get that across on this channel um, as open and as honestly as possible. Another comment here from uh, Kayan KR. Thank you so much for your comment. He says, I love these abstract images. Do you feel any disadvantage when shooting with a crop sensor? Uh, I thought this was a really interesting question. I have thought about this myself. Is there any disadvantage to shooting with the X-T3 over say my Canon 5D Mark IV? And yes, there definitely are disadvantages to shooting with a crop sensor. Uh, you get less dynamic range, you don't get the resolution, and I think most of all it plays on my mind that I know that the images from a crop sensor could be better. Uh, the 5D Mark IV does have a better sensor than the Fuji X-T3, and then, you know, what if I was to invest in the latest cameras? What if I was to buy the Canon 5... What is it? You know what it is, that camera that keeps overheating, that one, or the Fuji GFX 50 or 100 even. You know, there are there are many better cameras out there than the Fuji X-T3. And it all comes down to um, what the image is going to be used for ultimately and some of the compromises, you know, like uh, those cameras are very expensive. They're also big and heavy. The reason I brought the Fuji to Iceland instead of the Canon 5D Mark IV is because it's smaller and lighter and I can also interchange the lenses with my Fuji X-T4 oh, which was my main video camera. I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a tiny part of me that you know was thinking you know getting a bit jealous when I look over and see uh, Alistair Ben shooting with his Nikon D850. <laughs> you know that, that is it's the truth or um, Adam with his GFX50. And I'm there with the X-T3. Of course, I am a little bit like, oh, but you, you also can't live life like that. You know, you can't, otherwise you'd be buying a new camera every six months. Um, and I guess that's the beauty of shooting with like the Hasselblad. I don't know why I'm pointing, you can't see it, but it's, it's over there. The beauty of shooting that is those medium format slides have the potential to be better than any digital camera on the market easily, especially, you know, when you get them drum scanned. Um, so yeah, I don't know, good question. Um, and I tried to answer it as honestly as possible. A comment here from uh, Julian Heritage, uh, or Heritage, 
Um, I'm probably in the minority and do like minimalist landscape images, but I'm not a fan of these, so sorry. Julian, please don't apologize. Please, please, please. Uh, photography is very subjective. Okay, I'm not even sure I'm a fan of the images in this video. Uh, like I say, this, this channel isn't my portfolio. If you want to see my portfolio, go over to my website and have a look at my gallery, which I am currently in the process of constantly changing and updating. So even then, don't judge it that much. <laughs> um, actually, that, my book is probably the closest representation to my portfolio. Um, but no, it's fine. I don't want or expect everyone to be a fan. But what I would say is if you're not a fan of the images, don't let that discourage you from watching the channel because it's very much about the process and maybe think about how you would have done things differently. Um, and then you can go out and try that yourself. Uh, so yeah, absolutely fine. Um, I don't even like every image in the video from this series and I'm constantly changing my mind over images as well. Sometimes I love them, sometimes I don't. So it's it's absolutely fine and a fair comment and I do appreciate the uh, the the constructive criticism. Andrew Herbert, probably some of the best images you've ever made. Love them. So the reason I've read this comment out after the last comment by Julian is because it just goes to show um, how subjective photography is. Julian, not a fan at all, uh, whereas Andrew, big fan. So it's very difficult. That's why you should really only shoot images that you like rather than trying to please everybody else. Because if you try and please everyone, you'll please no one. Another interesting comment here from Dave Nelson who wants to know if you can get a digital back for the Hasselblad. Now, this is a really interesting uh, question. And I say that because, yes, you can get a digital back for the Hasselblad. In fact, Hasselblad have released a camera uh, it's brand new. I, I don't even know if it's available in the UK yet, uh, maybe. Anyway, it's called the 907X50C. Uh, it's a really long name and it's a modular camera and it looks brilliant and I'm actually hoping to get my hands on one to have a play with. But the back of that will fit onto the back of the Hasselblad. So yes, you can get a digital back, but that poses a question. Um, what is it that I love so much about the Hasselblad that I have? Is it the fact that I'm shooting film or is it the fact that I'm using an old camera that shoots square images exclusively? And as much as I definitely will have a play with the digital back on that camera just for fun, it for me, it massively defeats the purpose of the camera. It, it does. I think if I was going to shoot Hasselblad medium format digital, I'd use the full system. I'd invest in the full system, which is uh, the back and then this this little middle bit, which I assume is that your lens goes onto and then your lens. So I'd get the full system. Yes, it would be expensive. But the Hasselblad, the reason I bought it is because I, I just want I just want to slow down and I want to work very, you know, I want to work manually and I wanted to interact more with the landscape and be forced into a position where I really have to analyze the landscape. And that's where film comes in. And I've talked about this in past videos about how film forces you to be incredibly perceptive about the landscape, the bright areas, the dark areas, the tonality throughout the scene. What film should you use to get the best out of that scene? All these things, for me, help me get a bit more in touch with the landscape. And that's why I love, or I'm loving at the moment anyway, shooting film. So yes, you can get a digital back. Yes, I would try it and play with it. No, I wouldn't buy it and use it as a full-time system. For me, that would defeat the purpose of that camera. If I was gonna do that, I'd just buy a Fujifilm GFX, if I'm being completely honest. Okay, so final comment here. It's a long one, so I'm just gonna paraphrase, and it's from Jay Pruitt. Um, and he basically says that he loves the channel, but he thinks the images in that last video were rubbish. Um, he especially doesn't like the image of the green volcano. Uh, which she says could have been taken with an iPhone and there would be no difference. Um, and he says he doesn't think any of the images would be good enough for my calendar. Speaking of which, my calendar is going to be available to purchase in about two days. Um, that's coming. I, I'll. I, I, oh, man, I don't want to plug it yet, but it's there. It's coming. And I'm really happy with it. Oh, and it's square, <laughs> believe it or not. Well, the images are square. Anyway, back to the comment. He says he's not a hate hater, very much the opposite. And he is a fan of my art. And he loves that I'm exploring film. Um, he says it's kind of like a child learning a new art form, but it's cringeworthy. Um, so, uh, Jay, 
Uh, I love your comment. I do. I think it's a well thought out comment and don't at all find it offensive in any way, shape or form. I think it's very constructive criticism and feedback. I disagree with you on the could you shoot it with an iPhone kind of thing because only because iPhones, they're very great, they're very convenient. Um, and I think the mentality that I would have if I had a phone in my hand looking for compositions would be different to the mentality if I had film camera, that square camera. And the green volcano image, I love it. I know you don't like it and that's fair enough, but I really appreciate uh, the tonality of the sky um, and I appreciate the uh, the pastel colors and I appreciate the subtle quietness of the foreground. You know, it's not a loud image, it's not an obvious image, but I appreciate that. You say that you don't like the shadow on the right hand side. I'll be completely honest with you. When I was shooting that image, the shadow bothered me so much. It really did, but obviously there was nothing I could do. Um, but as I've scanned the image and looked at it more, I kind of like the detail of the shadow, I do. Uh, but what I like most about that image is the way the light is falling on the mid ground, the mid middle part of the image. Because if you were stood there in that location, what you would see is you've got black desert stretching out in front of you, probably for about a kilometer or two. And then after that, it goes green. And the light was just falling and hitting the green area. Started, you know, the light started off on me and then as the shadow came, basically the black desert fell into shadow and all of the light was hitting the green landscape and the green hill. And that's what really, you know, one of the, the subtleties that I noticed about the scene and that I like so much about the image. And that isn't something you would really pick up on unless you look at the image large. Uh, rather than just on YouTube or Instagram. But um, no, I massively appreciate your comments. And again, I'll say it again. My YouTube channel is not my portfolio. Um, I very much like to chop and change between types of landscape photography. You know, I go through phases and I go through uh, intimate phases, grand landscape phases, hiking phases, uh, walking in the woods phases, you know, all these different things. And I know that it's not going to be to everyone's taste, but it's simply impossible for me to cater to everybody out there. Um, so yeah, I appreciate your comment um, and I hope my images weren't too cringeworthy. Uh, but again, sometimes I just like to show the process. And I'm not, just by showing an image, I'm not proclaiming that that is a successful image. Um, I'm just simply showing the process and the result. And that's that. So uh, again, guys, thank you so much uh, for watching that video. And if you've stuck around this far in this video, you are my favorite people. Because I know a lot of people click off um, after a while, because they do, they do go on a bit, these videos, don't they? Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for commenting in the last video. Thanks for watching the last video. Thanks for watching this video. My calendar should be available to buy on Wednesday. Don't hold me to that. But it's a good one. It's I've done it slightly different this year. My book's available uh, now and forever. And next week's In the Field video is great because we get caught in a sandstorm. And that gets interesting with protecting oh, yeah. gear and eyes and nose and ears. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And got some cracking images as well. So make sure you tune in on Wednesday, but until then, thanks so much for watching and I'll uh, uh, see you in a few days. All right, bye, 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 bye.